Welcome to the Schmidt House. I'm Don Trosper, Public History Manager here at the Olympia Tumwater Foundation, and we're just pleased as punch. I guess that's an old saying, isn't it? <laughs> we're just pleased to have you here and welcome. It's kind of like family reunion. How many are first-time visitors that have never been to a talk before? Uh, every, every time we have a few, that's great. Well, what we have is a sign-up sheet we like to pass around, so go back and forth between the, the seats here and, uh, and let us know you're here, but also if you would like to be on our emailing list, you can put that on there too, so just gives us a record that you're here, how many. I uh, want to thank TC Media for helping. We have an archives now on YouTube of TC Media recorded talks here at the Schmidt House, along with our other history features. So uh, we would encourage you to get onto YouTube and type in Tumwater History or Schmidt House History Talks, and you'll find all kinds of things that we've uh, covered in the past. H how many of you know what March represents on our historic calendar? Uh, I think a few do. Okay. That's right. It's Women's History Month. And uh, without women, none of us would be here. So. I, I was joking with Susan earlier that, that you could say that for men, too, but it's all right. But uh, Shanna's covered the basis in Thurston County history for, for a long time, really. And uh, she, for 20 years with the Thurston Regional Planning Council, where she worked with Olympia Tumwater and, and the county in historic commissions and preservation. And then from 2006 to 2014, she was a coordinator of the Washington Women's History Consortium uh, for the Washington State Historical Society. And we've asked her to kick off the month Women's History Month with us, talking about women's history with a general focus on the Tumwater area, although I'm sure we'll cover some Olympia folks too because we're pretty closely related. But uh, let's have a good Schmidt House historic welcome for Shanna Stevenson. Well, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, I'll uh, extend my uh, happy Women's History Month to everyone too. Um, a little bit of background about that. In 1917, Russian women marched against conditions of fruit privation and the effects of the war on March 8th. And on March 25th, 1911, over 100 women died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, and that dramatized poor working conditions for women. And in some countries, uh, women receive special gifts and flowers on March 8th. I think that's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> The United Nations recognized uh, Women's History Day on March 8th in 1975 as part of the International Women's Year, and then first begun as a project in the 1970s to bring women's history into schools in California. Women's History Day on uh, March 8th was expanded into a week, and in 1981 it was first recognized by Congress, and then they've extended the recognition to Women's History Month uh, beginning in 1987. So I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about women's history in Tumwater with just a few of the stories of making, uh, women making history in this area. Well, from archeological investigations, native people are known to have occupied the area around the mouth of the Deschutes River as a fishing and food gathering camp. They may have established a permanent village here as well. Even before Euro-American exploration and settlement in the Northwest, Native American women often held leadership positions in their tribal groups, just as they do now. A Native American woman named Queen, or Kai Kai Sumlut, who according to available records was related to present-day Nisqually and Cowlitz, guided a group of the Wilkes Expedition in 1841 from Fort Nisqually to Black Lake. They called her a chief and said the success of their mission was owing to her direction and management. Native American women were keepers of oral traditions and managed vital food gathering and processing functions. Some Indian women married Hudson's Bay Company employees and later other non-Indians who moved to the area from the mid-19th century uh, on, a practice that helped bridge the gulf between Native American and Euro-American cultures. There were also Native Americans, oops, there were also Native Americans recorded by American settlers in and around Tumwater. Ada Sprague Mao recorded that across the bay from Tumwater was an Indian village and that Indian women with their baskets of olalis, blackberries, or of oysters, clams, and fish hanging over their backs suspended from a broad band across the forehead were familiar sights to our youthful eyes. Mary Thompson Beatty uh, recalled that when she and her family reached Tumwater, they visited an Indian camp where they had just finished drying and hanging up st a string of gooey ducks. Native American women may also have gathered cattails in the areas to use in matting and basketry. The Simmons uh, Bush Party came over the Oregon Trail in 1844 and had first planned to settle in what is now Oregon. 
Their plans changed because the provisional government of the Oregon country had passed an act in 1844 which excluded blacks, slave, free, or mixed race from settling in the area and stated punishments, including lashes, for doing so. This seriously affected the mixed race George and Isabella Bush family. Since generally the provisional government authority was not enforced north of the Columbia, this likely was one of the deciding factors in their change of plans to come to, to Tumwater. Well, Isabella Bush, of course, was a member of that party who settled in the Tumwater area in 1845. There are no known photographs of George or Isabella James Bush. She was born in the early 1800s, married George Bush in Missouri in 1830. They had a large uh, family of children, uh, six sons. She cared for five young boys as they traveled across the plains and mountains to the northwest and gave birth to a son uh, named Louis Nisqually after they arrived in this area in 1847. Because of his race, George Bush required an act of Congress to receive his donation land claim in 1855, and Isabella Bush was owner of half the claim. I don't know if you can see on there, but that's the actual uh, bill uh, from Congress uh, granting the Bushes their claim, and it calls out specifically that half of the claim uh, goes to George Bush's wife, Isabella Bush. We know about her, though, through many accounts. She helped establish the family's first gardens, the berry bushes and fruit trees, helped get turkey and chicken eggs to hatch, tended a fine flock of sheep for wool, and it was said by the pioneer McLean family, her watermelons were the envy of other Thurston County gardeners. Her son, Lewis, provided detailed information about her role in the prosperity of the farm through her relationships with the Plamondons, who were early settlers associated with the Hudson's Bay Company, and with Dr. Tolmy, chief factor, factor at nearby Fort Nisqually. She secured chickens from the Plamondons and turkey eggs from Tolmy. She then traded the turkeys for sheep from, the Tolmy, uh, from Tolmy uh, from the large Puget Sound Agricultural Company flocks near the fort. Lewis Bush noted that her flock, quote, was one of the greatest sources of profit in a few years. Pioneer diaries are replete with annotations of the hospitality of the Bushes. Numerous pioneers traveling the Oregon Trail to Puget Sound stopped at the Bush farm for food and rest. Many stayed while the men searched for their future home sites. Many were weary and sick, and Isabella Bush took care of them. Said one account, night or day, the Bushes kept open house to all comers. No one was turned away without being fed and sheltered, and in many cases, their wagons carried substantial gifts of fruit, garden truck, and grain from Mrs. Mr. Bush's abundant stores, and that was likely also provided by Isabella Bush. George Bush was likely reacting to an 1855 law banning mixed-race marriages in Washington Territory when he published the item seen here, and he specifically gave legal notice that Isabella Bush was his heir. The law banning those marriages was later repealed. Bush Prairie still bears their name. Isabella died in 1866 and is interred in the Union Pioneer Calvary Cemetery with her husband. The State Archives Building in Tumwater is named in her honor, and in 2017, the city of Tumwater designated Isabella Bush Park, a fitting location for growing foodstuffs, and that's the image you see here. And an interpretive marker about Isabella Bush is at the site. Well, Michael Simmons, part of the Simmons Bush Party of 1845, had married Elizabeth Kindred in 1835 in Iowa, and in 1840 they settled in Missouri. Born in Indiana, she was just 15 when she married her husband and 24 when they started west. They also had uh, four young children, and she gave birth to another child, Christopher Columbus Simmons in Washougal after their trip over the Oregon Trail, so she was pregnant crossing the trail. Traveling with the party were her parents, David and Talitha Kindred. She eventually had 10 children and died in 1891, outliving her husband by nearly a quarter of a century. She added family uh, to family holdings by buying additional lots and participating in local business activities. And I'm going to be quoting from a lot of obituaries here, and you'll notice um, this one about Mrs. Simmons called her an estimable lady. Mandana Smith Kimsey Bush was born in Missouri in 1826, and they, her family crossed the plains in 1847. She was married at the time to Duff Kimsey. They settled in Oregon and lived there until her husband died in 1858, and she married William Owen Bush, the son of George and Isabella Bush, in 1859. She already had five children from her first marriage, and they had two more children, Belle Bush, 
about whom you'll hear more later, and John Bush. She died in 1899 and is buried uh, in the Union Pioneer Calvary Cemetery. And I think this is an exceptional photo. It shows Mandana uh, there. She's kind of off to the left with her husband, William Owen Bush, along with other Bush brothers and other family members and dignitaries as they proudly prepare for one of the world's fairs where they exhibited the products from the Bush farm. William Owen Bush uh, uh, became one of Washington's most famous farmers. He was born in Missouri and then came west with his parents. He went to the California Gold Rush and he and his wife lived on Mound Prairie uh, after their marriage and then after his parents died, they moved to the Bush Prairie Farm and with his wife and brothers, they helped organize the Western Washington Industrial Association in 1872 to promote agricultural exhibitions. The first of their many agricultural awards was in 1875, which prompted the territory to authorize an exhibit at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876. There they won bronze medals and certificates for the best wheat in the world. I sometimes ask people from Eastern Washington where the best wheat in the world was grown. <laughs> They're surprised. Um, the exhibit was put on permanent display at the Smithsonian, and then the medal and certificates were proudly shown from community to community around the territory. In 1889, William Owen Bush represented Thurston County in the first state legislature, and he was instrumental in passing the bill um, which was to use federal money from the Morrell Act to establish a college for the study of the science of agriculture, which became WSU. In 1892, the state of Washington, Thurston County, and the city of Olympia appropriated $2,300 to take a Bush exhibit to the Chicago World's Fair, where again they won impressive medals and certificates for vegetables and grain. Bush also exhibited at the Buffalo Fair in 1901, in St. Louis in 1904, and I think this is likely uh, uh, an image as they prepare to go to the Chicago Fair, because you can see the number of family and community pictured here. When he died in Olympia um, in February of 1907, eight years after Mandana, the local newspaper headlined him, Pioneer of Pioneers, and said, no other resident of the state or territory throughout its history did more to advertise the state. Of course, that was with Mandana at his side. Cordelia Jane uh, Smith Crosby was the daughter of Jacob and Priscilla Smith. They were natives of Pennsylvania and England, and she was their oldest child. They moved to Indiana, then came overland to the Portland area in 1851, later going to Whidbey Island. But by 1857, they had settled on what was the James T. Phillips donation land claim. The Smith House, built in the late 1850s, still stands near Yelm Highway and College, owned by the city of Lacey. She was born in 1839 in Indiana, and she married Nathaniel Crosby III on Chambers Prairie, probably at her uh, parents' home. She wrote a reminiscence about the family trip across the plains in 1851. She said, it was in the early spring of 51 that my father took immigrant fever to come west, she noticed it wasn't her mother, <laughs> to what was then termed Oregon Territory, get some of Uncle Sam's land, which was donated to anyone who had the perseverance and courage to travel six long, weary months through a wild, savage country with storms and floods, as well as the terrible heat and dust of summer to contend against. Well, by endowing women with important property rights, this federal Oregon, or Oregon Donation Act of 19, 1850, sorry, provided an incentive for families and women to settle in the Northwest. The law reflected a growing trend among states and territories to give married women rights over property. For example, under this law, a married couple settling in the territory before 1850 could claim up to 640 free acres of land with half in the wife's name, and you saw that with Isabella Bush. For settlers coming to the area after 1850, the amount of acreage available was half, but the joint ownership provision remained the same. Spurred by population growth as settlers took advantage of the Oregon Donation Act, Washington separated from Oregon Territory in 1853. For women, the attainment of property rights and partnership status with their husband was an important step toward equal rights in what eventually became the state of Washington. Well, Nathaniel uh, Crosby III's family had come to the Northwest uh, by sea in the 1840s, and you might know his uncle, Clanrick Crosby, built the large five-story flour mill on the Lower Falls and established many businesses. 
Nathaniel, uh, we know, built the Crosby House around 1860, worked for his uncle, and later operated a store in Olympia and worked on local steamers. The Crosby House is owned uh, by the city and managed by the Daughters of the Pioneers, Chapter 4, and we'll hear more about them uh, later. Uh, Cordelia and Nathaniel had two children, Frank L. Crosby and Harry Crosby, who, of course, was Bing Crosby's father. She died in 1902. Well, Annie Connor Hartsock was one of the famed Mercer girls. Some of you may remember Here Come the Brides. Anybody remember that t -shirt? Well, Asa Mercer set out to bring unmarried women to the Northwest where there was a shortage of women. But I think it was really more Here Come the Teachers and Here Come the Suffragists. Born in Concord, New Hampshire in 1826, she was extremely well educated. She attended Exeter Female Academy and McGraw Normal Institute, which was teacher's training. She came with the Mercer Party in 1866 aboard the ship Continental, and she taught in Lewis County and in Tumwater. She married a local carpenter and builder, Mark Hartsuck, in 1869. She was a member of the Congregational Church and the Women's Club of Olympia, and she died in 1918. But she left a really interesting first-hand account of what it was like to be a Mercer girl. Um, and she said, after they landed in San Francisco from the east, it took three weeks to go to Seattle. When we arrived, the docks and street corners were filled with men watching a few immigrants land. Some of us had thick veils for which we were truly thankful. We went to the hotel for the night in the morning. As I was ironing a few trifles in the kitchen, a respectable looking man approached me and asked if I thought any of the women would like to get married. <laughs> I told him I didn't know of any. I was the first Mercerite to come to Olympia having a letter to Governor Pickering and others, and this was May 23rd of 1866. Well, speaking of suffragists, Susan B. Anthony did come to Tumwater in 1871. She was a, on a trip around the Northwest, uh, accompanied by Oregon suffragist Abigail Scott Dunaway, and she had just spoken before the territorial legislature when she came to Tumwater, where, unfortunately, as you see here from her diary, she had a very small audience. I've just learned about Martha Tower. Um, she lived in Tumwater, and she may have hosted Anthony. Anthony returned to Olympia in November, where she, along with other territorial suffragists, organized the first Washington Territory Women's Suffrage Association Convention, which set the stage for women's suffrage campaigns in the, in the territory. Women in Washington voted from 1883 to 1888 during the territorial period. They were unsuccessful, however, at statehood in 1889 and also in 1898. Most women in Washington finally achieved permanent suffrage in 1910. 10 years before the federal amendment. And they may have been inspired by this trip uh, of Anthony to the Northwest. Well, James Biles came to Tumwater in 1853, built the Biles and Lee store in 1869. The upper floor was used as a dance hall and club room, and the building later hosted the post office. It may have been the location, I think, of where Susan B. Anthony made her presentation, but I, I'm not sure of that. But we know other events were held there, including the Ladies' Sewing Society of Tumwater Fair in 1872. And we'll learn about more Tumwater needlewomen later in the program. And they charged 25 cents, which I thought was kind of a lot for this. Well, often women have no obituaries or very brief ones in the early years. And this one, honoring Anna Barnes, is, is, is exceptional. Nelson and Anna Barnes arrived in Oregon in 1850 and came to this area in 1852, and Barnes Lake is named in their honor, and they had a donation land claim there of 619 acres. I wanted to read this obituary. It's from the Washington Standard, May 4, 1878. On Monday, the 29th, in Tumwater, Anna Stevenson Barnes, wife of Nelson Barnes, passed to the life beyond the river of death. She had been, for many years past, a sufferer from painful physical infirmity, in the past year or more, a confirmed invalid, requiring constant care and attention. Her pathway to the grave was smoothed and brightened as far as possible by the loving ministrations of relatives and kind offices of the many friends who esteemed her as a pioneer resident of the territory, no less for her high moral worth. Mrs. Barnes was born in Massachusetts in February 1801. She was married to her husband, who survives her in New York in 1820, where they resided 17 years and moved to Indiana and thence 1850 to Oregon and to the Sound in 1852. 
She had been a constant resident of Tumwater for 26 years, near, nearly the usual period of a lifetime. The funeral took place at Tumwater last Wednesday, Reverend Mr. Fire, Fairchild delivering a beautiful and appropriate discourse before a large assemblage from country and town. The remains were buried in the Masonic Cemetery. Thus, one by one, those who braved the hardships and privations of pioneer life are passing to Summerland. May they not there as here mark the pathway and prepare a home for those they leave behind. Well, uh, Johanna uh, Steiner Schmidt was born in Worms, Hessen, Germany in 1851, and her family operated an inn on the Rhine River where she learned several languages. She met uh, Leopold Schmidt at the time he was attending brewery school in Worms. They married and he took her to Butte, Montana in 1879 where he established the Centennial Brewing Company. She moved to this area in 1897 and together they built this house. They had six children. She died in uh, 1911 and is interred here on the grounds of the Schmidt House. Well, Belle Bush Gaston was the daughter of Mandana and William Owen Bush. She was born in 1865. She married George Gaston in 1882. Her obituary referred to her parents' and grandparents' pioneering role in the development of the area, but lauded her personally. Mrs. Gaston, aside from her many and varied club and public activities, was a woman of great personal accomplishment. She was both musical and literary in her taste, being both a writer and an accomplished violin player, while she was widely noted for her proficiency as a housekeeper. She did not forget her rural roots. She was an advocate for the Carnegie Library, which was to serve rural areas, and also for a ladies' restroom in Olympia to serve rural women coming to the city. She was also president of the Olympia uh, Civic Improvement Club. It's a little strange to talk about a women's restroom, but when you think about it, women from rural areas coming into Olympia, there was no safe private place for them. And so it was a big issue uh, nationally, as well as here, that, that rural women had, had a place to go. Well, women, of course, were partners in the development of area farms and businesses. As noted earlier, women claimed land in their own names under the Oregon Donation Land Law. These two images illustrate the hard work and fun, as well as pride of women who work side by side with the men on the farms around Tumwater. Shown is a local hops festival around Black Lake in the late 1890s, and hops were a very important cash crop at the time. Also proudly shown here are Joseph and Magdalene Wicker Wigger Wiki uh, on a farm near Munn Road that was, uh, they rented as it was owned by Arthur Jones, and they began their long history as dairy operators. They hauled grain uh, byproduct from the Olympia Brewery as feed for their dairy cattle. They delivered their milk to hotels and restaurants in Olympia. They moved to a farm near the present day DOT shops and in 1906 purchased what was the Hayes property near the area now known as the farm where they continued to operate the Pioneer Dairy and according to the family, donated the land for the Chambers Prairie Grange. They also provided free milk to children attending the nearby Hayes School. Born in 1876 in Switzerland, Magdalena died in 1974. Shown in the foreground are Magdalena with daughters Marie, Lena, and Jenny. Ada Mao was born in Ada County, Idaho in 1867, came to Tumwater in 1869 with her parents, Alfred and Wilmina Sager Mao. They came to this area after a succession of moves across the country. Alfred filed on a homestead near Black Lake but died in 1874, so it was Wilmina who proved up on the claim, which was owned by the family for many years. The family uh, moved to Tumwater during the winters to allow children to attend school. Mrs. Mal completed local schooling and attended the University of Washington. She was a longtime teacher in public schools in King County, Skagit County, Little Rock, Hoquiam, Tumwater, and was principal of Lincoln School in Olympia. After her marriage to Dr. John Mal in 1898, she largely concentrated on civic work. One of her biggest contributions was during World War I, when she was the only woman member of the Thurston County Council of Defense. She organized and headed the men at women who assisted in the war effort. She also worked with the local Red Cross. She was a longtime member of the Women's Club of Olympia and a founding member of the Daughters of the Pioneers Chapter 4. She promoted libraries and also led the effort to clean up the Union Pioneer Calvary Cemetery in, in uh, the 1920s. She continued to serve the community until her death in 1953. 
1941, the women's club celebrated her birthday with these words. Whenever the city fathers needed women's help, they almost invariably called on Mrs. Mao to organize and lead them. For instance, during the World War, she was the only woman member of the County Council of Defense. I remember she spent days on end in her car organizing every precinct in the county into the group known as Minute Women. To all these activities, she gave cheerfully without measure of her time, her thought, her executive ability, and her loyalty. In no undertaking have I ever known her to shirk responsibility or having assumed it to fail to carry it through. In a day when opportunity was newly opened to women, she went out to meet it and accepted its responsibilities. Well, regarding the Tumwater Minute Women, um, looking at the records, we know these women from Tumwater were actively involved in the home front efforts during World War I. There were 140 women, uh, Minute Women in the county. Uh, besides war bond sales, they supported food conservation and assisted with other efforts, including the Red Cross and child welfare. Well, um, during World War I, the Schmidt family donated uh, the Tumwater Club for the Red Cross. Uh, the local Red Cross began meeting during this time at the governor's mansion when it was hosted by First Lady Alma Lister and her daughter Florence. Uh, the Tumwater Club, uh, shown here, was built in 1908 as an off-hours club for Olympia Brewery employees. And after the Schmidt donation, the hall hosted the very popular Red Cross dances for Fort Lewis soldiers. And I ran across a note that Mrs. Peter Schmidt was one of the dance hostesses. Just to give you an idea of what the Red Cross did in the county, they were very busy. Uh, they were prolific uh, knitters and sewers and uh, um, did a lot during World War I. Well, another Bush descendant is Annie Bell Gaston Sutcliffe. She was the great-granddaughter of George and Isabella Bush and daughter of Bell Bush and George Gaston. She was born in 1883, and she was a very early elected woman in the county. She served two terms as Thurston County Auditor in 1912 and 1914. She worked for the county assessor as well as being a representative for the Ellison White Chautauqua. She died in 1957. So this uh, image uh, shows uh, the greater Bush family. There were lots of women in the Bush family. You can see William Owen Bush there in the center with a cane. And uh, uh, to the left of him is Annie Gaston. Belle Bush is uh, the second from the right there. She's kind of the petite woman in the white top. The other women are um, descendants of the Bushes. Um, John Bush had four daughters. And so there were uh, a lot of women in the Bush family, and this is likely taken out at the Bush farm. Well, we know that a lot of women were teachers. Uh, Bob Chamberlain related the story of his, his experience in the Plum Station School and teacher Grace Michaels in the late 1930s in a rich heritage, Tumwater area schools. That school was located near McCorkle Road and Old Highway 99. He said of her, this humble woman instilled us all with honesty and humility. Her infinite patience and her dedication to education were remarkable. She came from Olympia each morning by bus. Her first duty was to build a fire in the big stove. She then rang the bell at 9 a.m. and commenced her day of managing eight grades of school children. She would stop at about 11.30, long enough to put on a big kettle of rice to be served at noon to those who hadn't brought a lunch from home. At the end of the school day, she began her duties as a janitor after grading papers and preparing for the next day's lessons. Additional responsibilities included coach and playground supervisor. After that long day, she would don her coat and hat and flag down the stage bound for Olympia. And it's noted that women teachers were often paid less than their male counterparts. Well, Eva Clark Hewitt was a native of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, born in 1875, and she moved to Tumwater in 1890 with her parents, John and Lavinna Stillman Clark. She married Charles E. Hewitt, and they owned and managed the Hewitt Drugstore in Tumwater, along what is now Deschutes Way, where Interstate 5 is now located. Mrs. Hewitt, I think, was the heart and soul of Tumwater during her long tenure as postmaster of Tumwater uh, from 1915 to 1942 and people met and shared the life of the town with Mrs. Hewitt. She was an honorary member of the Daughters of the Pioneers and a member of the Women's Club of Olympia. 
and she died in 1957. Ethel Eck succeeded her as Tumwater Postmaster. The photo shows the interior of the Hewitt drugstore. Uh, daughter Laura, Laura Hewitt Henry and her husband Phil are shown here. They led her around the store and they're shown along with customer Blanche Bye. And a really adventurous woman was uh, Gladys Baroker. She was a native of Bellingham, born in 1914. She began to fly planes in 1932 when she graduated from high school. She parachuted, was a wing walker, and even rode a motorcycle. She and her husband, Herb Baroka, worked at the Olympia Airport beginning in 1937, and with Gwyn Hicks, they operated the Baroka Hicks Flying Service. In 1939, St. Martin's hosted a summer program to foster and develop private flying, and the program taught by Gladys Baroka and her husband hosted both men and women. They were the first women to attend St. Martin's. Later in 1939, the program was officially the Civilian Pilot Training Program located at St. Martin's. She was the ground school instructor from 1939 to 41, and according to Father John Scott, probably the first woman instructor at the school. After Pearl Harbor in 1941, the P-38 planes from McCord Air Force Base uh, located at the Olympia Airport, and the, they moved inland to first Pasco and then Coeur d'Alene, where they trained pilots throughout the war. She's been uh, recognized uh, in many aviation halls of fame, including Idaho, uh, at the Seattle Museum of Flight and also at the National Air and Space Museum. She died in uh, 2002. And uh, the picture on the right is, is uh, as she was an instructor at St. Martin's. Amy Magda Anderson was part of the family of entrepreneurs that came from Sweden to this area in the early 1920s. They operated Tumwater uh, lumber mills, Tumwater ready cut houses, and Olympia Harbor and later West Coast pulp mills. She was the oldest of the family. She was born in Sweden in 1887, and she joined with her brothers, Arthur, Edward, Sten, Osi, and Carl, and Olaf in the business, and they're shown here with their parents and another sister. She worked as the office manager, and she was at the helm of the finances for the business. The family's famous for the ready-cut kit homes, which dot Olympia and Tumwater and were marketed nationally and abroad. More than 500 ready-cut homes were built in and around Olympia, according to one newspaper account. She was a founding member of Zonta in Olympia, and she died in 1965. Well, as promised, here's more information about the Daughters of the Pioneers. Uh, the chapter 4 was established in 1930, and members traced their family's arrival in Washington or Oregon Territory before 1870. Members of the Schmidt and Crosby families purchased the Crosby House in the name of the Daughters in 1947, and they renovated what was then a rundown house that, as noted, was built by Nathaniel and Cordelia Jane Smith Crosby. They, I think, rekindled the spirit of Tumwater's history by restoring the house and soliciting period furnishings. During the construction of Deschutes Parkway, they fought to reroute the roadway to preserve the house, becoming leaders in historic preservation in the area. They've collected a lot of documents and information about Tumwater's history. And in 1981, they gave the house to Tumwater with a provision that the daughters would have a life estate in the property as long as Chapter 4 continues. And they continue to do tours and programs as well as maintaining a pioneer garden. And this is part, of course, of the National Register Tumwater Historic District. And this is an image of the daughters in the 1950s. Elizabeth Eyre was, uh, has the distinction of being the first woman to graduate from the University of Washington School of Architecture in 1921, and she's the first licensed woman architect in the state in 1930. She was from Tumwater, born in 1897 and reared on Eyre Road, and she attended Bush Prairie School. After she graduated from the University of Washington, she worked for an architect, but she was only an office girl. They wouldn't let her be an architect at that time. Um, she did work with Edwin Ivey and took on more architectural studies. She took a leave of absence and uh, worked in New York and, and traveled in Europe and then returned to work with Edwin Ivey. With the Ivy Farm, firm, she designed many notable traditional style residences in Seattle, Olympia, and around the state, and there's some in the South Capitol neighborhood and on the west side of Olympia. She continued her own firm, uh, Air and Lamping, specializing in these specially designed homes, and during World War II, she worked for the U.S. Engineer's Office. She retired in 1970 and moved to Panorama, where she died in 1987, and if you Google her, she's really recognized as a pioneering woman architect in the state. 
Well, because of restrictions placed on raw materials during uh, World War II, the metal caps used by the Olympia Brewery were recycled. Women replaced men serving in the war by washing, sorting, and reshaping bottle crowns. The crowns were then shipped to San Francisco where new cork was applied for use in the bottling plant. Um, and this is a 1943 photo of those women working at the brewery. Well, this uh, information about Sally Eck was brought to my attention by Don Trosper. Um, she was the wife of Arthur Eck, and she took over his position as Justice of the Peace in Tumwater during war service, his war service, and then was elected in 1942. And another woman, Loretta Dunn, was also elected Justice of the Peace that year. She was a policewoman in Tumwater and in 1943 became the first policewoman in the city of Olympia in answer to what was described as the juvenile problem during World War II. She patrolled the city with MPs and police and that was to enforce an 11 p.m. curfew for those under 16. She also served as an air raid warden in Tumwater and we're still researching more about her but she's an intriguing woman. Ada Woodruff Anderson was born in San Francisco and lived for a time in China, but after the death of her father, she came with her mother and brother to Tumwater to live with her uncle, Nathaniel Crosby. Crosby. She often recalled living near the falls on the river and exploring the Crosby Mill. It was my delight, she said, to steal up the forbidden stairways of the mill to the top story and watch men hoist grain from the boats that floated up under the walls at flood tide. She attended school in California but returned to Washington and was a teacher in the Yelm Bald Hills area beginning at age 16. She said later that at the time teachers were more unusual than bears. She taught in Snoqualmie and returned to Olympia to run a private school. And she used those experiences to become a writer of note. She first wrote short stories and then novels such as The Heart of the Red Furs, her most, uh, most well-known work. She also wrote The Strain of the White and The Rim of the Desert. She died in 1956, and many thanks to Yelm History Project uh, for this information. If you go to their website, you can find out a lot more about her. Another well-known name in Tumwater is the Henderson House, and it was built originally by brewery employee William Nauman and his wife Louise, purchased in 1909 by John and Catherine Rohrbeck, and later, uh, beginning in 1939, owned by Frank and Agnes Henderson. Um, they owned the house until it was purchased in 1977 by the city of Tumwater. Um, the Hendersons had five children and Agnes for a time took in boarders at the house and later worked for the state and that she pictured there on the left and the, the upper right picture is the house about in 1939 uh, when they moved into the house. Well, a native of Iowa, born in 1898, Marion Argo came to the area in 1942 and worked in the real estate business, and she had all women working for her. She was the first woman Tumwater City Council member in the town's history in 1960 after she was elected to a two-year unexpired term, and she was sworn in in March of that year. But her tenure was stormy. She was ousted by other male council members soon after because she missed three meetings two apparently unscheduled in the month of April while on a vacation. And that was because at the time council vacancies could be declared if council members missed three consecutive meetings without asking for leave of absence. Argo though was firm that she should take her place on the council. I'm here, she said, to discharge my duties in connection with that office in the event that any member of the council or anyone else for that matter interferes or attempts to interfere with or obstruct me in the proper performance of my duties I will have no alternative but to institute appropriate legal action to remove such interference. Well, as I mentioned, her colleagues swiftly ousted her, but just as swiftly reinstated her after a firestorm of controversy and widespread support by the city's women. According to a news report, more than 100 people jammed into the council chambers, which at the time were above the fire hall in Tumwater, to witness her reinstatement. After finally taking her seat, she quickly set to work leading the effort to upgrade Tumwater from a fourth to a third class city. And after serving the remainder of her two year term, she left the council to continue her real estate career and she died in 1970. Well, things are, are different now on the Tumwater City Council. <laughs> However, not until 1975 was the next uh, woman to join the city council and that was Clarice Duffy Kennedy. Um, 
uh, current women council members are Joan Cathy, and I've listed some of the former members uh, on these slides, and Debbie Sullivan and Eileen Swerthout, and uh, just this week, uh, Lieta Dahlhoff was appointed to the council, and I'm sorry I don't have a, a picture of her, so that makes uh, four council members. Clara Munch Schmidt uh, was born in 1889, uh, native of Chicago and New York. She was introduced to Peter G. Schmidt when he was in Milwaukee on brewery business, and the Munch family were friends of the Schmidts. They married in 1909 and moved to Tumwater. She was very active in the arts, bringing community concerts to the area, and was instrumental in regional opera and in bringing symphony music uh, to Olympia. Uh, the Schmidts had four daughters and one son. She made a bequest to Tumwater School District at the time Peter G. Schmidt Elementary School was named in honor of her husband, and she died in 1960. I don't know how many of you have noticed that the uh, armory in Tumwater was renamed, and is named for this woman, Colonel Edith May uh, uh, Nuttall. It was remain, uh, renamed in 1999 to honor her. Uh, she had served in three wars. She retired as Assistant Chief of the U.S. Army Nurse Corps and was in that position from 1974 to 1978. And it was uh, the very first time an armory had been named for a woman. She was born in Aberdeen, Washington in 1919. She grew up in Montesano, received her nurses training at Virginia Mason in Seattle and later at the University of Washington. She began her service in World War II and served in Korea and Vietnam. Besides her battlefield service, she also worked in Washington, D.C. and headed the Army Nurse Assignments Branch. She received a very prestigious award in 1978 called the Dr. Anita Newcomb McGee Award. She died in Tacoma in 1984, and she's interred at Willamette National Cemetery. And if you go to the armory and knock on their door, they will let you in, and uh, I hope. And you can see a really wonderful display about her, her service and her life. So it's great we have that here in Tumwater. Well, I'm sure many of you remember uh, fondly, as do I, Joyce Bristol Nichols. She was a native of Nebraska. Her family moved to Council, and she later attended the University of Washington. She was Tumwater's librarian for 26 years before her untimely death in 1996. She operated the library out of the storefront for many years in the Southgate Shopping Center, as many of us remember. She was the driving force behind the new library and spearheaded its construction. It opened in 1995. She was also active in many community organizations, and she was honored in 1993 with the Washington Library Association Merit Award. Uh, a, t a meeting room at the library is named in her honor, and her family created a scholarship in her name at Tumwater High School which gives aid to students planning to pursue careers in human services. And she fostered very close relationship between the high school and the library. Um, and uh, there's also a special Going the Extra Mile Award at the annual Tumwater Track Meet in her honor. Another person probably familiar to many of you is Ann Kelleher. She was originally from Vancouver, Washington, and her great-great-grandmother and great-grandparents and family came west in 1865 in one of the last wagon trains from Missouri, and she really gained uh, this love of history from her family. She graduated from Seattle University, started teaching in 1965, and began her teaching in Tumwater in library media in 1977, where she remained until uh, 1998. Well, she became very interested in living history, and she worked with fellow teacher Brian Button on a project for the 1989 state centennial. And they said, what would be a project with lasting meeting? Uh, and they uh, applied for a grant from Tomwater Schools and worked with THA, Tomwater Historical Association, and that's when the Homesteader Program was born. Uh, they brought in a lot of mentors to teach pioneer schools, and then the students themselves shared uh, their learning with fourth graders. And it began in 1988-89 uh, school year in Tumwater. And they also, um, many of you probably remember them at community, uh, community events dressed in pioneer clothing and doing hands-on activities. And uh, they had the cider squeeze at Tumwater Falls Park and, of course, the annual Pioneer Fair for fourth graders. Brian and Ann were named Educators of the Year in 1998 by the National Oregon-California Trails Association 
and Historians of the Year in Tumwater. And Anne additionally received Historian of the Year Award from the South Sound Historical Society in 2016 for her work with Thurston County Through the Decades, which was a series of events that united efforts of small historical groups in the county. And Anne retired in 1998, and she continued as a volunteer. And the, the uh, last year for the Homesteader program was 2015-2016. And over 1,400 homesteader students received that uh, training, and they provided hands-on activities to over 11,000 fourth graders during that time. And Ann uh, left, uh, talked about it kind of poignantly. She said, as we look back through our scrapbooks at the hundreds of photos taken over the years, we see young girls in calico and bonnets sitting at the spinning wheel, smiling over their patchwork, bending a little to help one, a little one use the washboard, Young men in muslin shirts and vests pa uh, patiently explain safety precautions at the forge, demonstrate the shave horse, give the cider press one last crank. We see girls huddle together under hand-knit blankets, sharing warmth and friendship. We see boys at old-fashioned play with hoops and tug-of-war. We see exuberance of youth in the twists and turns of the Virginia reel. She called it education at its finest. Well, the final uh, group of women I want to uh, note here are the Tum Tumwater Homestead Quilters. And you, I talked about the sewing circle in the 1870s. Well, they're still here in Tumwater sewing in a way. The group began in 1990 to raise money from the for the Tumwater Historical Association Homesteaders Program. But it's not just a quilt guild. The group is also interested in preservation and history. Their projects have included quilt registries, shows, and workshops on skills and preservation, and they've registered 500 community quilts that has extensive documentation, and I call that lots of women's history. About 10 members continue to be active, and some of the founding members are Kathleen Kuntz, Joanne Baxter, Sandy Gray, and Gail Tracy. And they still have a lot of upcoming programs and projects, as I call them, securing women's history through stitches. And shown here is the group as they recreated an Oregon Trail era quilt from the Bigelow House collection. And they did that meticulously, and the, the uh, quilt is now on display at the Bigelow House. Well, this concludes my short look, not so short maybe, look at women's history in Tumwater. But there are lots more stories. You probably all have stories about your families, and I, I know I've heard some today. Um, and that's great. Be sure that you document them. Um, and women's history, of course, is not just her story, it's our story, and we know women were always there making history, and we certainly honor them this March, and um, I'm interested in hearing more stories as well. So thank you. Would you like some question and answer time? Sure. Any, Any questions, questions for Shannon? Um, reminiscences about like, women's history? Yeah. I recently arrived in the area from Seattle and um, got interested in that history. Read a, a book by the granddaughter of the Denny's, and I'm wondering if there's. I'd like to know about more about the history of Thurston County. Tumwater and Olympia were the places. I mean, Seattle is often the great <laughs> hinterlands. So I'd like to know more. Have you got any references that you can mention? Well, this is. I, I'm a member of the. Uh, this is a. I'm, just say I'm a member of the board of the Old Historical Society and Bigelow House Museum, but they have, I, I think, a very good website um, at, that has a lot of reference material. And Don, what would you suggest for Tumwater? Well, I'd go on to YouTube and, and go through our archives of the history talks that we posted here. There's been a yeah. wide spectrum of stories, not only at Tumwater, but Olympia and Thurston County and, and beyond. So uh, that and, and books that we've worked yeah, there, on. There was a, a book done for this uh, 150th anniversary yes. of Tumwater. And Don uh, also has done a great series of books, too. And they're available in libraries. Is that yeah, what, what you Yeah, libraries right after that. Mm -hmm. uh, Thurston it's County Historical Journal is also now just been published. And, and Karen Johnson here has been the uh, editor yeah. of that. And mm -hmm. so that's a new adventure in print form. Right. Yes. And then there's your book, Lacey Olympia. Well, yeah. Yes. There is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Other questions or reminiscences about women in your families that you, you know were making history? Everybody makes history, so. <laughs> but any other questions or comments? 
Yes, I'm fortunate enough to have had uh, two books written about my family, uh, the um, Schneiders by Deb Ross. Right, that's, yeah. that's another great one. And, and uh, they were uh, neighbors of the Bushes when they came. Uh, I know that George and uh, I her name. Isabella. Isabella. Isabella helped them when they first reached the water. Yeah. Yes. Here, Matt. Oh, hi, Shanna. I just wanted to let people know that we have a vacancy currently on our historic commission. And if there's anyone here that lives in Tumwater that's interested, uh, contact me. Or actually, Don Trotsky's on our commission as well. So uh, we're looking for someone to fill that vacancy. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, our next talk is going to be in two weeks, March 15th. And we're excited about having our very own assistant curator here at the Smith House, Megan Ackerman, uh, doing a, actually a, a talk on, based on a book or a, a paper that she did for a thesis, thesis uh, for the uh, history of the Olympia Brewing Company. And she made use of the archives in our basement here. And she's, in fact, this is a, a future book I think we're going to have here too. And so uh, we're going to have her give a talk on the history of the Olympia Brewing Company on uh, Thursday, March 15th. So we should have a pretty packed house for that one. And I would encourage you to get here at that 11.30 opening time uh, because it's gonna be a, we might have to close the doors. We'll see how it goes, but she, she's great. I should mention too, uh, in our schedule that's been published in our new fancy little trifle brochure, we had to have a cancellation on our April 5th talk. Uh, Drew Crooks has an illness, and so he's gonna postpone his talk until next, next season that we put together. So instead, we're going to be hosting the curator and the executive director of the Northwest Carriage Museum from Raymond. Uh, Jerry and Lori uh, Bowman will be here, and that is exciting. That's a world-class museum there in Little Raymond. And so we're going to have them here as a replacement for, for, for Drew's talk that he was going to give. So uh, that's, that's coming up on April 5th, another Thursday. And you had a question? We have some next Tuesday here for the house here. Yeah, we do Schmidt House guided tours, and we would love to, you can email or call me and we can re make a reservation. Bob Krim has worked for this family and in, in this house for 60 years, semi-retired now, but he has 60 years worth of stories for every room in this house, and it takes about an hour and a half. So we would encourage you to take advantage of that and hear his stories. In fact, the more questions you give, the longer the tour gets. But uh, we're thinking about an hour and a half. It starts at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. And uh, so give me a call or email, and we'll get you on the list. So uh, that happens once a month, but we can also work, work out special uh, arranged tours if you have a group that wants to do something. Like a group of 8 to 15 people would be just ideal for that. So thank you for asking. Anything else? All right, well, you're dismissed, and I'm sure Shannon will kind of stick around here for any uh, private questions you might have. But thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Bye.